So when World War I came to an end, there was a profound relief from all parts of Europe. And in fact, pacifism will become a very powerful political force in the next two decades. But there was also profound anxiety because the war seemed to have turned the world upside down, especially when it came to gender roles. Now, you have to keep in mind that war propaganda, as you can see on the poster, had celebrated male heroism while depicting enemy nations as sexual predators. At the same time, the actual experience of the war left many men vulnerable, fragile, and in need of care. Heroic virility was an illusion shattered by the experience of passivity and impotence in the face of mechanized violence and trench warfare. As the British poet Sigrid Sassoon so powerfully expressed in his war poems, many men, irrespective of class, origin, and political persuasion, had had to confront their utter vulnerability in the face of a senseless war that was only, as he wrote, shapeless gloom and death's grey land. So the years after the war were consumed by mourning and attempts to make sense of this brutal and new conflict. Monuments to the dead appeared everywhere across the European landscape. And if the conflict is, had ended, um, its material, ideological and cultural effects lingered and haunted the post-war decade. In fact, for many artists, authors and intellectuals, the war had remade their vision of the world, undoing the very foundations of civilization. It fueled and inspired much of the culture, art, and visions of the post-war years, which is what I'm going to talk about. Two figures became emblematic of the effects of the war, that of the flapper, or the modern woman, and that of the veteran. Now, for some, these figures and the changes from the war cause great anxiety. For instance, French novelist and former veteran Pierre Drieux La Rochelle saw only a raised landscape. And in the face of these new figures, especially the new woman, he wrote, this civilization no longer has any clothes, no longer has churches, no longer has places, no longer has theatres, no longer has paintings, no longer has books, no longer has sexes. And notice how he moves from civilization to culture to sexes. So the war had not just transformed the lives of soldiers, it had overturned the differences and hierarchies of gender, sex and society as a whole. And the modern woman epitomized this. Now notice how this new figure, both a cultural icon and a social development, um, represented all of this. Her short hair, her short hems, and androgynous dress were actually the result of what had happened during the war, of the necessities of working in munitions factories, where women had had to cut their too long skirts, cut their hair so they could work at these machines um, and in what were traditionally men's jobs. Now people could see young women smoking out in public and working, though this was still um, rather limited in some countries. And this was a worry sight, worrisome sight for men like Trio La Rochelle. Some, like the German novelist Ernst Junger, argued that the war had been a mystical experience and they needed now to sublimate that struggle. Others used the experience of the war in their art and their visions for a post-war world, often becoming staunch pacifists and committed leftists. This was the case of German expressionist Otto Dix, who expressed his delusionment when the war ended. And we can see this in his 1923 drawing of two bleak figures, a prostitute and a veteran, standing side by side. For Dix, the syphilistic scars of the prostitute echoed the terrible mutilation of the soldier. And the works titled summarized the ethics of both suits figures. 
they were both victims of capitalism. And on the left, you see another German expressionist, George Gross. The surrealists, who are mostly based in France or French, believe the war to be the product of bourgeois capitalism and imperialism. Now, surrealism was an artistic and cultural movement made of artists, writers, intellectuals, most of whom were veterans of the war and who came together in more or less organized groups in Paris, which became one of the cultural capitals of Europe. Most surrealists were inspired by Freud's notion of the unconscious and wanted to bring the unconscious to light, and they were obsessed with the fragmentation of the self and the dissolution of sexual difference and of the body, as you can see in some of these surrealist images. And in fact, their art often fictionalized fragmented and dislocated bodies, as in the paintings of René Magritte or the dolls of Hans Bellmer. Others sought only to recover the wholeness undone by the war. So as you can see, the post-war years were about the working through and forgetting of the war, both things happening at the same time. And there was a frenzy for cultural innovation as this was the age of mass culture, consumerism and new technologies, such as photography, radio and cinema, that reshaped how people understood and experienced their lives. This is why the 1920s were nicknamed the Roaring Twenties, or in French, the Crazy Years, the Année Folle. This was the era of mass culture. You see it in fashion adverts, in magazines, because there was an explosion of the press where uh, women's fashion here plays on these gender ideals with presenting these fashionable trousers with the title Eve Wears the Trousers. Or cinema, with cinema houses now popping up everywhere in every capital city, like in Paris. And this is the age where cinema goes from being silent and with the first talking film in 1927. These years were also named the jazz years because jazz became incredibly popular. Jazz seemed to be a new, exciting, and energetic form of music that broke all of the rules of classical music and that appeared to be the opposite of the exhausted bourgeois European culture. And jazz was especially popular in France, where many African-American musicians and artists came. Now, remember that France appeared to these African-American artists and musicians to be a colorblind society, even though it was a colonial one. And this was a place where uh, these African-American musicians and artists could escape the segregation of Jim Crow. And this is the age of the Harlem Renaissance um, in the 1920s in the United States. So these musicians and artists performed in cabarets and were celebrated. And its most celebrated icon was Josephine Baker, artist, singing, and performer, who became famous for her banana skirt, dance on stage, and then went out to be the heroine of films such as Tem Tem and Zuzu, of which you have some extracts. However, the passion, the love of jazz, does not mean that French escape racist stereotypes, as you can see from the cover of the French jazz magazine. In fact, this love of blackness, which was named Afrophilia, was also, in fact, an exoticization and fetishism of all things black, flattening out different experiences into one singular homogeneous and stereotypical experience and vision of blackness. And here you can see the fascination with blackness with the photographs of Man Ray or the vogue of Afrophilia and how it relied on racist stereotypes in the furniture, in upper class houses, but also in posters like this one for a cigarette company for the 1931 colonial exhibit. And because this was still the age of empire, and France was a confident and proud colonial nation that showcased its colonies in elaborate displays at the 1931 colonial exhibit that France hosted, which displayed for French citizens to enjoy all of the joys of the colonies, complete with human zoos, um, as they were called. 
as was the fashion in Europe since the late 19th century. And it's important to remember that the 90s and 20s were the great imperialist decade. Still, we see the emergence and proliferation of artists and the writers who challenge gender roles, like Claude Cain, the Jewish lesbian communist photographer who was on the margins of a surrealist group, or the modernist writer Virginia Woolf who wrote A Room of One's Own and Three Guineas, a denunciation of fascism and of the war. This was also the era of an increased visibility of same-sex desire and couples as cabarets, bars and nightclubs emerged in Paris, London and Berlin and where same-sex desire no longer appeared dangerous, so much so that German sexologist uh, Magnus Hirschfeld argued homosexuality was normal, not a deviance and natural and sought to get rid of paragraph 175, which criminalized male homosexuality in Germany. Now, this, this criminalization was not the case in France, but that doesn't mean there was greater acceptance despite greater visibility. Still, it's important to keep all of this in mind because this is the context in which fascism emerged.